Ciao! And welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to talk about the syntax of block structures. Many of the popular languages today use curly braces, following in the tradition of the syntax of the C language. And today's video is inspired in part by the new Scala 3 syntax that's come out, but we'll get to that later. Let's start with TypeScript. And first, let's look at the problem we're solving today. I have a file from the GeoNames website a list of all the cities in the world with a population of at least 15,000 people. And I open up the file, count some things up in it, and print the results. Specifically, I have a list of regions, which could be any number of things, but right now I just have the northern and southern hemispheres, where the order in this list matters. The south edge of the northern hemisphere is zero degrees latitude, and the south end of the southern hemisphere is negative 90 degrees. And whenever we get to a new city in the file, if its latitude is above the south edge, it counts that in the population of that region, going in order until it finds a region that it matches. So let's look at the tally here. We loop through the lines, split on tab, parse the field at index 4 as a latitude, at index 14 as population, loop through the regions. If we ever see our latitude is above the south edge of that region, we add to the population and break out of the loop. Note that this is an imperative solution. And I use an imperative solution modifying the regions themselves in most of the languages today. So let's see how it does. We see 2.4 billion in the northern hemisphere and 385 million in the southern. Again, this is just cities with at least 15,000 people in them. But having seen what the program does, let's look at our focus for today, which is the syntax of block structures. Many of us are probably familiar with the use of curly braces for blocks. And often we contrast this with languages such as Python that use indentation. But there are additional options out there. And one of the things that motivates me on this topic is having taught programming before. When people are first new to programming, even though they've seen indented bullet lists in their life, it's not necessarily easy to think through indentation and block structures anyway. Often indentation ends up being rather random. And if indentation is random, then if someone leaves out a curly brace, it can be hard to see where that curly brace is missing. And the error message you get is rather unclear. Unexpected end of file at line 52. Why down here? Because any of the other contents of this program could have been contained inside the block for the tally function. And even with correct indentation, Deno doesn't help me know where that curly brace is missing. Because of this, some other languages have different kinds of syntax, or some style guides suggest you should always end your curly braces with a comment that says what you're closing. The counter argument to this is that if your functions are that long in the first place, you probably should fix your functions and make them simpler. But in the real world, we find that things aren't always as clean as we'd like them to be. I dug around a little bit in some of the most popular software projects for some of the most popular languages. For example, from Elasticsearch here, we have a function that has a number of nested for and if blocks inside of it. And in C++ here, from Microsoft's calculator application, we also see a number of nested blocks, including both loops and ifs. And from the TypeScript source code itself, we have this rather long function, which goes on for quite a number of lines, including a nested function. Maybe we can say this is bad style, but in reality, these things happen sometimes. And so it's possible that there might be better ways to manage your syntax in such circumstances. And interestingly, TypeScript itself, and JavaScript as well, in the form of JSX or TSX, can nest XML inside of it which technically has a closing tag to match the opening to see where it closes at. Is it more important to have named close tags in a document like HTML than it is in a computer program? I don't know. I also considered using XSLT for an example today, but didn't quite make that happen. Now, interestingly, close tags are not always required in HTML. I'm missing the title element, but close TH and close TD and close TR are all implied because of the semantics of the file format. We see it says right here in the HTML5 standard, when closing TR, TD, and TH elements can be left out. If we go back to the parent of XML, SGML, or standard generalized markup language, we see they had shorthand to make the close tag optional. So for example, instead of saying slash italics, you could just say slash if you felt it was clear in the context. Maybe that could be allowed in TSX and JSX, but it isn't. Notice our squiggly underlines. Anyway, We'll come back to this notion of labeling your block closes in a minute. But first, let's look at some other options. Let's see Pascal. 
containers like parentheses exist in Pascal, but the blocks use begin and end as keywords rather than curly braces. Let's prove the program works. And there we see the same output as before. And furthermore, the same kind of issue can happen in terms of which close is missing as we had with our curly brace language. If I delete the end, we get an error message at line 55 where it says, I wasn't expecting your closing period because this could have been a block inside of my existing function. You know that begin and end in Pascal behave a lot like curly braces do in C in the sense that if you only have one child, they're technically optional. So for example here, if param count is less than one, then raise an exception. There's no begin or end. My for block also contains only one child. So it works just fine to leave the begin and end out. However, just like in the C style of curly brace syntax, probably not a good idea to imply through indentation that you have a block when you don't really. So again, this is a detour into something that acts like curly braces as we know them, but with a different kind of syntax. And this varies somewhat from, for example, Ruby, which also has end to close our blocks, but it often has implied beginning to the blocks. Do is used when you want to receive a value for parameter for that block or for just passing any block into a function. But the if block, for example, has no starting token to say when the block begins. You can say then in Ruby, but when you've gone to the next line, it's just implied. Interestingly, for a simple one line if in Ruby, you do have to have the then there. If I take it out, no good. And the end is also required, even if it's on the same line. Now, interestingly in Ruby, you also can make your blocks with curly braces. And they have slightly different syntax rules, but often end up behaving the same. So it often depends on your exact needs or what you're trying to convey at the moment, which kind of syntax you'll use. We'll see this kind of flexibility again in Scala 3. It might remind us a little bit of languages like Racket that have interchangeable parentheses, curly braces, and square brackets. But before we get to Scala, let's take a look at some other languages, including Elixir. Now Elixir is the one language where I chose to use a functional solution because data isn't mutable in Elixir. I either could use a separate process to achieve state, or in this case, again, I chose to use a functional solution. And thanks much to Sritesh Bhattarai for improvements to the final version of this program. Because I can't modify the regions, I said I need to reduce the lines, starting from the beginning regions, down to a modified version of them that goes from population zero to something larger. And MapReduce is one way to make this tally happen. And this is sequential MapReduce rather than parallel, where we have an accumulator to keep track of whether we've seen a matching region or not. If we haven't, and the latitude matches the region, then we return an updated region and an indicator that we found it. Otherwise, we just pass along the region unchanged. Let's run it. And we see the same answer as before. Now in Elixir, our blocks are different again from either Pascal or Ruby, even though we close our blocks with the end keyword. We commonly start our blocks in Elixir with a do keyword, which is an interesting choice for a functional language. An alternative to the do keyword is anonymous functions, which use an arrow rather than the do word. Now IO is still allowed throughout Elixir, even when mutation isn't, but perhaps they chose the word do because it's shorter than begin. I'm not sure. But in any case, the do keyword is required. And interestingly, when you have anonymous functions wrapped in parentheses, it creates an effect where you can tell more context to what's happened because the parenthesis is also missing as well as the end keyword. Furthermore, Elixir is somewhat clever. If I delete this end keyword, maybe I could still be inside of my def module for region. And the error still officially happens down at the bottom at line 39. However, it looks at my indentation and says, I bet that when you forgot to close was on line two. So if I have enough experience to indent my code correctly, I'll get a helpful indicator of perhaps where I made my mistake. Again, I found that new programmers don't always do this very intuitively. Maybe that's an argument for starting with an indentation based language or an automatic formatter. And meanwhile, before we get to Scala, I wanna take a look at one more language with a syntax that feels very creative by modern standards, but it's had this kind of syntax for quite a long time. It's the first language I learned to program in, although with line numbers instead of subprograms, and this is basic. 
I'm using free basic here. And note the wide variety of syntax we have, which is similar in some ways to other languages such as bash. We have sub in sub, while, when, type in type, do until, loop, for, next, with the name of my index variable, if and if. And some of the creativity here I think relates to how they want to present it to the user. Basic was a very imperative language, especially back in the go to line number days. But if we're reading through here as instructions for index from something to something, do some stuff, this is like an instruction next index or do this and loop. When I see loop, it means go back to the beginning. So we think of these as imperative instructions, which can also feel like assembly or machine code, but they have the net effect of catching when you have things missing and knowing what goes with what. Let's just see it working first and we'll get the result we expect. If I delete the end if, it tells us, if we look at our first error, what line number our error is at. The same thing can work for any number of other things. It knows where the error occurred because the syntax has such variety to it. Now note that my index variable is not required for my for loop, but if I have it, it has to be correct. So let's go back to making it happy again. Now that we've seen the other languages, let's get to Scala and see what they've done in version three of the language. But I'll be boring and start with curly braces like we had before. Scala was originally built to be familiar to Java programmers, though with a number of different features. And so we start out with curly braces. And the curly braces are still available in Scala 3. And I've chosen to run this inside of the Scala REPL because I couldn't find a convenient way to just run a Scala file as a script in Scala 3. Maybe someone else out there knows how to help me out with this. So instead of using this as a main function, I'm going to manually call the function from the REPL and it works as expected. You can imagine if I delete a curly brace, it won't work anymore. But let's see what happens if I reload it. It says that either this function is dedented too far or a curly brace is missing before this point. Because in Scala 3, they've started paying attention to indentation. We also get our error at the end of the file, but it knew something was wrong before then. So Scala 3 not only can watch indentation, but can also use indentation just to structure your program in the first place, which perhaps starts to feel a little bit more like F sharp or Python at this point. And I can load the indent based version of it if I can type correctly. So in this version, I don't have my starting curly braces and they're implied instead to be indentation based for if a then keyword is required to go indentation based instead. Overall, our program is shorter because of using indentation. However, curly braces are still required in certain contexts where these really are anonymous functions instead of normal blocks. And they have started investigating experimental syntax for the future to help reduce these curly braces further. But what if I feel like pure indentation is unclear? What if, for example, we're in a long function like this? Do I want to just make use of my editor to hope I can work through this? Well, for people who have such concerns, they added some additional features to Scala 3 as well. So for example, if I want to make it clear that I'm ending a for loop here, I can say end for, and that works well. If I try to say end if, it's misaligned. And I can't just say end either. In this case, it thinks it's an identifier. And interestingly, when you end a function definition, you don't say end def, you say end function name, which reminds us of next index in basic or labeled breaks in languages like TypeScript that have that feature. But of course, if you feel it's already clear, you can just leave them off. And just for interesting comparison, I did a version from Scala that has all of the ends in place as well. Sort of fun to see side by side the curly brace and the end base syntax, as well as the version that just takes them out entirely. Anyway, I hope this has been fun. Maybe we can look at other syntax issues in the future as well. Arrivederci.